Okay. We are going to be going over the CBO for mechanical ventilation in the neonatal rotation. We're going to go over a bit of the background knowledge, um, hooking patients to the ventilator, and what's expected of us as students to su successfully complete the CBO. Um, before we actually get into mechanical ventilation, we're going to review tubing compensation. Um, you'll be expected to review the basics and what will happen when you turn tubing compensation on and off in a few different modes with the instructors. All right, so back to how tubing compensation works. Um, if a ventilator is not tubing compensated, the amount of volume that the ventilator sends is not actually what the patient will receive. Some of that volume will be lost to the tubing. Um, a lot of the new ventilators, like the Servo I, um, will calculate the tubing compliance for you in its pre-use check and send extra volume to compensate for what's lost to the tubing. Um, the volume that actually makes it to the patient is known as effective tidal volume. So, before we go any further, I'm going to show you. This is the servo eye. It's already passed this pre-use check and it's hooked up. We know tubing compensation is turned on because of the little C right here. Yeah. Um, if you want to turn it off at any point, which we're going to go over why you would do that later, um, hit the menu button, it will compensate, compliance, and it'll ask you if you want to turn it off. So I'm just going to hit yes for now. So you see the little C is gone. So your tubing compensation is turned off. Okay. I'm just going to turn it back on for now. So same thing to turn it back on. Menu, compensation, compliance. Okay. So, um, we're going to be going over tubing compliance in pressure control and PRVC, or basically any volume guaranteed mode. But, um, so tubing compliance with pressure control. If you decide to turn off tubing compensation and pressure control, the tidal volume on the ventilator will be higher than what it was before you turned it off, which hopefully we'll show you in a second. Um, the extra volume, so the ventilator will read, the volume will all of a sudden get bigger as soon as you turn it off. Um, the effective tidal volume and chest rise is the same. The extra amount of volume that's seen is what the ventilator was sending before to make up for tubing compensation. So I'm going to turn it off. Right now it's about 10, 11. So hopefully we'll see a bigger tidal volume. Let's see. So yeah, it popped up to about 30, 31. So the extra volume is what it was using to compensate. So I'm just going to turn it off again. Okay, so the other one I'm not going to show you, the volume guaranteed modes, I'm just going to mention what it does. Um, tubing compliance with PRVC, um, you should take caution when doing this with neonates. Um, PRVC uses the lowest possible pressures to achieve the pre-selected tidal volume that you choose. Um, when you do turn it off, the ventilator will display the exact same tidal volume that was selected. Um, but you can see the chest rise and effective tidal volume do decrease. Um, the ventilator is no longer sending extra volume to compensate for the tubing compliance, so that's something to be aware of okay. in volume gear. So the first step to the CBO is circuiting the ventilator in the pre-use check. Um, you will be expected to fully circuit the ventilator, including the humidifier, neonatal circuit, temperature probes. You'll also need a sterile water bag, your vent sheet, and endotracheal tube connector. Um, you'll also be expected to go through the pre-use check. Um, we're not going to go through that in this video, though. Something really important to take in is at the end of the pre-use check, you always make sure to turn the tubing compensation on. Um, once you initially turn it on, it can be turned off and on later at any point. The only time you would turn tubing compensation off would be extremely low birth weight babies, so very premature babies. So we're going to go over why. Um, so a normal tidal volume is 5 to 8 mils per kg. So the more premature a baby, the smaller his tidal volumes will be. For example, a 1 kilogram baby's tidal volumes will be, will be approximately five to eight mils per breath. Um, neonatal endotracheal tubes are uncuffed. Um, because the tidal volumes are so small, it is very difficult for the ventilator to measure accurate tidal volumes. The ventilator can count the rate, but the measured exhaled tidal volume will pretty much be zero. Therefore, the minute ventilation will also read zero. The 
Alarms can be a major issue in premature neonates being ventilated with tubing compliance turned on. The minimum minute ventilation alarm is 0 0.01 liters per minute. When the tidal volume being measured is essentially zero, the minute ventilation will also be zero and the ventilator will alarm. So I'm going to show you just in the alarms the lowest you could possibly go is 0 0.01, unfortunately. So except um, so in the case of low birth weight infants you would turn tubing compensation off to increase the tidal volume being read and to avoid unnecessary alarms so the second step of the CBO is initial ventilator settings and alarms there's two major modes that they use for this the main one is SIMV pressure control with pressure support or just basic pressure control. In SIMV, the pressure control always has to be greater than the pressure support. It won't let you go any lower. Um, the maximum rate it'll let you go to in SIMV is 60. So if you, the doctor or you want to go any higher, you'll have to switch to pressure control. Um, so this is just on the servo I. Um, so you'll be expected to know two basic ventilation strategies for obstructive and restrictive patients and be able to adjust your settings for specific pathologies. The most common type of restriction seen in neonatal populations is respiratory distress syndrome or RDS type 1 and prematurity in general. The more premature, the more restrictive the baby will be. With these types of patients, you will use a strategy that includes lower tidal volumes and increased respiratory rate. So for this example, we're going to go with that type of baby. And we're going to show you normal settings for any infant. And then we're going to show you how to do it with a restrictive baby. Um, the other type is the strategy for obstructive patients yeah, includes over. decreasing the respiratory rate and inspiratory time to give the patient longer exhalation times. You should also be wary of air trapping with these patients. So, the initial settings for any patient includes um, the TI is basically set with gestational age. So, if the baby is 28 weeks gestationally, we would go with 0 0.28 inspiratory time. The pressures are basically the same starting out as bagging, so you start at 20 over 5, so physiologic peep, and oops, you would set the pressure control above peep at 15, so your peak inspiratory pressures would be 20, 20 over 5. Uh, the rate, anywhere between 30 and 60 for any infant. Um, the more premature they are, the higher it will be. Um, yeah, so the FiO2, we're going to set it at 100 and just wean very quickly. Uh, the inspiratory rise, you don't really have to do anything with it now. You can adjust that later. It's basically for patient comfort. Um, the trigger is pretty, if it's flow triggered, we're going to set it at 5 or negative 2 to start, most likely 5. Uh, and you can adjust that later if need be. We are ventilating a dummy right now, so we're going to keep it there. Um, yeah, so this would be basic settings for any infant. So with us, we're going to go with a restrictive type pattern. So we're going to decrease the tidal volumes and increase the rate. So to decrease the tidal volumes, you're basically going to decrease the pressure. So just decrease it a little bit and turn the rate up a little bit more. That's all the instructors will really expect you to do for that part. Um, initially, you're going to keep the alarms very wide um, because you're going to make, when you hook the baby up, you're going to make adjustments on the fly and you don't want any unnecessary alarms. You're always going to tighten it later before you leave. So, it's going to be a 20 over 5, that's quite high. Everything's set very wide right now, so we'll come back to that later when we go to tighten it. Um, so, step three is attaching the patient to the ventilator. The so basically someone will be bagging the baby, the endotracheal tube will be secured. Um, you always make sure you turn the ventilator on prior to hooking it up to the patient. 
we've already got it hooked up to the patient, but so you would switch the vent on right before you do it. Um, the first thing you do once the baby's hooked up is assess chest rise. If you determine the chest rise is insufficient, you can increase the pressure control until you judge that you're getting sufficient chest rise and tidal volumes. Um, you also, once they're hooked up and you're good with the chest rise, you should auscultate and check for good air entry. Uh, you just do a quick ABC, make sure the tube's not moved, um, and the patient's tolerating the settings. So, step four is basically assessing the graphics. You want to make sure there are very minimal leaks by comparing the inspiratory and expiratory tidal volumes, which are both right here. You should expect some leaks because it's an uncuffed tube. So right now they're actually pretty good. They're very close to each other. You should assess the flow waveform for any signs of secretion. So the flow waveform, it's the one in the middle here. Basically you're looking for little bumpy lines. It tells you if there's secretions or water in the tube. You should also look for, assess the amount of air trapping. So you want the flow waveform to come back to baseline. If it's not, you should suspect air trapping. You can also go to the next page, and there's the VEE in liters per minute. That's the um, flow at the end of a breath, right before the next breath is given. So anything above two to three, you should kind of expect a little bit of air trapping. And the last one is to assess the inspiratory pause. Um, so if there's a big pause on inspiration between exhalation, um, you can check with the doctor if he wants it decreased or what they want to do about that. So yeah, there's four little things you assess on the graphics. So, before you do anything else, before you ever leave the ventilator, you always want to tighten the alarms. So, we'll start with the upper pressure limit. We're on a pressure control mode. So, pressure really shouldn't vary that much. It's usually 3 to 5 above, so 25 is completely fine. Uh, the minute volume and yeah, minute volume you want it at 10 to 15 percent below what the actual minute ventilation is. So right now it's at 0.21. And our notes say 10 to 15 percent above, but a lot of times that's a little bit too tight in the neonatal population. So a lot of people just stick with two liters per minute or just double what it normally is. The respiratory rate um, you want it slightly above. The normal 30 to 60 so 70 to 80 is probably fine depending on the baby I guess and just slightly below the normal the peep just two to three above and below so it's set at five we'll go three above and below apnea time 10 seconds for a neonate 15 for a pediatric patient 20 for an adult so we're good with those um, so step six is basically your vent check and documentation. Um, you want to do your initial vent check, including your parameters, alarms, auscultation, and plan for this patient. That part's pretty easy. So step seven, the instructors are going to give you an ABG, which you will have to interpret and make any additional changes that may be required on the ventilator. Um, you should also ask for blood gas to be done. Um, and if you don't, they'll just tell you the blood gas has come back. But yeah, that's pretty much it for this CBO.